And now for a very important part of our program, the huge challenge we face supporting people with mental health and addictions. Consider these facts, because they're not good. 30% of people over the age of 15 in Ontario, in Ontario will experience a mental health and substance abuse problem at some point during their life. 5% of Ontario's adults report that they experience symptoms of major depression. By the year 2020, mental health problems among children and youth are predicted to increase by 50%. All this takes a toll on quality of life and our economy. It's estimated mental illness and addictions cost Ontarians $38.1 billion per year. And now the province has signal, signaled it intends to tackle this problem in a very, very serious way. In the last provincial budget, the government said it would, it would be making targeted investments of $138 million, $138 million. The big question is, how will they plan to spend that money? Plus, we know that many AOHC members prioritize serving people who struggle with mental health and addiction, addiction issues. And we also know you want to continue improving on that work. And so we invited someone with, de with decades of experience and insight to guide us, Dr. Gabor Matei. For 12 years, Dr. Matei worked in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by hardcore drug addiction, mental illness, and HIV. With over 20 years of family practice and palliative care, care experience and extensive knowledge of the latest findings of leading edge research, Dr. Matei is a sought after speaker and teacher. He regularly addresses health professionals, educators, and lay audiences throughout North America. And so we are pleased to have him here. Please truly welcome Dr. Gabor Matei. Thank you and good morning. The first question is the sound. Can you hear me okay at the back there? You can't hear me to answer me, can you? Can you wave your hand at the back if you can hear me? Okay, great, thanks so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor to be in the audience uh, in, in an auditorium with people whose work is so worthy, including our honoree this morning. Um, the issue that he wrote about in a series of articles that I look forward to reading and in fact cannibalizing for, for my own next book um, <laughs> uh, is the central question really in addiction as well and also in the audience is my very respected colleague Michael Rackless whose work on um, healthcare and uh, the social determinants of health again is seminal to understanding the problems that we face here in Canada. Now. Of course, this is a very special morning in Canada because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has just published their landmark report in which they said absolutely nothing new, <laughs> which, is not a which, is not a which is not a criticism. It's not a criticism. When I say they said nothing new, they said nothing new to anyone who knows what's going on in this country, who's been working with um, uh, traumatized people like many of you have. But it's good to have it said anyway, because they're saying so publicly uh, in a forum and in a voice that now will amplify that information. And let me tell you about, well, and the denial has already begun. The denial has already begun. In the front page of the National Post this morning, uh, you know, they're questioning this phrase, cultural genocide. And I'll just quote you one sentence from the front page of the post uh, that let's not confuse things they say. Residential schools, after all, were schools, not death camps or killing fields. Really? How about the thousands of children whose bodies haven't even been found yet who died in these schools? How about, what kind of a school was it? My friend Carlene, Carlene is a, native woman from the Sea Shelt Band. And a few years ago, I was up there helping to lead a seminar, a healing seminar around addictions. And Carlene, who was 54 at the time, told me that when she was four years old, she was taken to the residential school 
where she, being only four years old, committed the terrible crime of speaking her own language, her native language. And the teachers dealt with that faux pas on the part of a four-year-old by sticking a pin in her tongue. So for a full, whole hour, this four-year-old girl in the 1960s in Canada, our home and native land, sat there with a pin stuck her through her tongue, and she couldn't put her tongue back in her mouth because if she did, she would cut her lips. And this is what the National Post says. This was a school, after all, not a killing field. So the power of denial of minimizing trauma is a very um, salient dynamic in our society. And that is exactly what makes addiction work so difficult. Because we medically, the official ideology on addiction denies the primacy of trauma, which I'll be telling you about. The legal system completely ignores trauma. So it sees addiction as a bad behavior. Fundamentally, we have two approaches to addiction. One is to see it as a bad behavior that needs to be punished or deterred. And if you want to punish or deter, what do you do? You jail people. Or you see it as a disease. So the official medical view of addiction is that of a primary brain disease, which is to say a disease that arises in the brain, largely due to genetic factors, due to genetic inheritance. And then there are some other factors that might also contribute number seven or number eight of which might be include trauma. This is the official definition by the American Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, whose course every addiction uh, physician has to complete in order to be certified. So to be certified as an addiction physician, you have to accept, or at least you have to be trained in the perspective that it's a primary brain disease largely determined by genetic inheritance, which of course, is a very convenient belief, apart from the fact that it's utterly unscientific, as I'll tell you. It's also very convenient socially, because if that's true, then we don't have to look at the implications of the residential schools. We can just think these poor native people are genetically troubled, poor them. But in terms of what social and historical factors led to that addiction, and what social factors which the Hamilton Spectator series, I'm sure, highlighted, contribute to the ongoing maintenance of what we call dysfunctional behaviors. That we can ignore if something is genetic. So as mentioned in the introduction, I worked for 12 years in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is well known as North America's most concentrated area of drug use. And the people that I looked after there um, were really entrenched in their addictions and uh, they uh, succumbed to them at an alarming rate. They would die of HIV, hepatitis C, suicide, overdose, violence, uh, of course, complications of uh, diseases like uh, liver cancer and so on. Let me quote you a little bit from my book In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, which is my book on addiction. This is at a funeral uh, where a patient of mine has died of an overdose and uh, her colleagues, her fellow addicted residents of the facility at which I worked, uh, gather uh, to, to commemorate her. I look at the small cluster of human beings gathered at the funeral of a comrade who met her death in her mid-30s. How powerful the addiction, I think, that not all the physical disease and pain and psycho psychological torment can shake loose its lethal hold on their souls. Nothing sways them from their habit. Not illness, not the sacrifice of love and relationship, not the loss of all earthly goods, not the crushing of their dignity, not the fear of dying. The drive is that relentless. How to understand the death grip of drug addiction? What keeps Penny injecting after the spinal abscess that nearly made her paraplegic? Why can't Beverly give up shooting cocaine despite the HIV? The recurring abscesses have had to drain on her body and the joint infections that repeatedly put her in hospital and so on. And to answer that question of what's the powerful death grip of addiction, simply by saying that it's a choice that somebody makes for which they need to be punished, or to say that it's a genetic disease that they inherited just doesn't deal with the issue. And let's look at why it doesn't deal with the issue. So I'm going to give you my definition of addiction now, and I want you to think about it in terms of yourself. So an addiction is any behavior that is associated with craving, 
temporary relief or temporary pleasure and long-term negative consequences. And the individual has difficulty giving it up despite those negative consequences. That's what an addiction is. Any behavior. Now notice I didn't say anything about substances. Obviously it could involve substances, but I'm talking about any behavior. Substance related or not. That gives you pleasure, temporary relief that you crave, long-term negative impact, difficulty giving it up. Now let me ask you, by that definition, how many of you would acknowledge that you've had some addictive patterns in your life at some time or another? Okay, so the very most of you. Let me ask you this, and I'm not going to ask you what it was that your addictive focus was, when it was, how long it was. I'm just going to ask some of you to raise your hands and then volunteer to tell me not what was wrong with it, which you already know, but what did you like about it? What did it give you in the t short term? Anyone? Yeah, what did it give you? Pleasure, Sorry? Pleasure, relief. Temporary relief, pleasure. Relief from what? Pain. Relief from pain. Okay, pain relief. Anything else? Yes, over there. Now, could somebody just repeat that for me? I didn't hear it. Okay, escape from some ter difficult thoughts. Is that right? Okay, anybody here closer to me? Yes? Present, being in the moment. A sense of being in the present, being in the moment. Exactly. Anything else? Comfort. Comfort. Okay, let's just look at what people have said. Pain relief. Escape from distressing thoughts. Presence. Comfort. Now, anything wrong with any of that? Aren't these the very qualities that human beings all want? In fact, isn't presence, comfort, relief from pain, isn't that something that we all so badly want to have in our lives? The point I'm making is that the addiction wasn't your primary problem. The addiction was your attempt to solve a problem. And the problem is, why did you have so much pain that you needed relief? And why did you not know how to find relief without an addictive pattern? Why? Did you have such disturbing thoughts that you needed to escape through that particular means? How come so many of us lack the capacity to be present in our own skins in the moment? And why did we have to turn to something destructive in order to be comforted? Again, the addiction is not the primary issue. The, uh, the addiction is your attempt to solve a problem that life has given you. And when you come down to it, what you will find is that all addictions are nothing but coping mechanisms. And so the, to understand addiction, first of all, we have to look at what is it that people are trying to cope with. And to understand what people are trying to cope with, you can't look at their genes. That won't tell you a thing. And just to say that it's a choice is also meaningless. You have to look at their actual lives in their actual circumstances and not just the individual life but through the multi-generational history of a particular family or a particular community or a particular people. Now this idea that mental health issues and other problems, including addiction, uh, may actually be, is in fact, originates in uh, coping mechanisms is finally being recognized in uh, medical practice, or at least in medical theory. It's far from being recognized in medical practice. But let me read you something um, that, uh, from an article that appeared three years ago now in February in the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. <clears throat> the article is from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, and here's what they say. Growing, sci growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, when children are highly stressed, or when children live in stressed environments, they adapt to those environments, uh, physiologically and psychologically, 
those adaptations help them survive in the short term and are the source of pathology later on. And that, I'll make the startling statement, although I won't have the uh, time to prove it to you this morning, except in the case of addiction, is the source, the major source of virtually all illness, whether you look at multiple sclerosis, whether you look at cancer, whether you look at uh, mental illness, whether you look at addiction. And so that addiction becomes a coping mechanism. What is it? It's a kind of self-soothing, obviously. And why do people have to learn to self-soothe? Because they were not soothed when they needed to be. And that goes back to childhood. So my contention is, and I hope to be able to demonstrate that for you this morning, that addiction begins not as a bad choice that an adult or a teenager makes, but in the failure uh, of uh, a child's needs being met, or in fact, those needs are being not just not met, but actually trampled on. In other words, trauma. Now, let's just look at addictions a little bit closer. Uh, so I myself was diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, when I was 54. <laughs> and uh, it made a lot of sense, and it, I, I fit the diagnosis in every way. And I was prescribed stimulant medication. Now, stimulant medication uh, include methylphenidate or Ritalin or dextrodine or Adderall. So it's either a dextroamphetamine like dextrodine, Adderall, or it's, uh, or it's methylphenidate like Ritalin or um, other, uh, other uh, medications. Now what the stimulants do is they elevate the level of a chemical in the brain called dopamine. I'll talk to you about dopamine later. It's an essential brain chemical for human functioning, for animal functioning actually. Without dopamine, we just can't function. So dopamine particularly is the motivation chemical, so without dopamine we're not motivated. I'll, again, I'll say something more about it later. Now, what else elevates dopamine levels? What all the stimulants do? What are the stimulants? Nicotine, caffeine. Some of you talked about how they're going to feel better as soon as they have lots of coffee. They were talking about their dopamine circuitry in their brain. Crystal meth, cocaine, these stimulants all elevate dopamine levels. Guess what? A significant percentage of substance addicts are actually self-medicating ADHD, but they don't know it. And if you look at the prison population, a significant percentage actually are diagnosed or diagnosable with ADHD. In other words, we're punishing people for having a brain condition, which deprives them of impulse regulation. So the stimulants are self-medications for ADHD. And if you work with addicts and you don't screen them for ADHD, you're just not doing your job. And most addictions physicians have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, what else do people self-medicate? People self-medicate depression. If you've ever taken Prozac like I have for depression, Prozac elevates the level of another brain chemical called serotonin. And serotonin is essential for mood regulation. Now, what else elevates serotonin levels? Guess what? Cocaine does. People self-medicate depression with cocaine. People self-medicate ADHD or anxiety with marijuana, which calms the hyperactive or the anxious brain. Certain kinds of marijuana, by the way, depends on the strain, will make anxiety worse, and other strains will soothe anxiety. So it depends which strain you happen to buy. People self-medicate post-traumatic stress disorder with the opiates. So when you look at the veterans who come back from North America's adventures in the Middle East, many of them suffer PTSD in the United States and also in Canada, they'll self-medicate with the opiates because these are very powerful in soothing not the PTSD, but the symptoms of it. People self-medicate social phobia with alcohol. The person who is afraid to open their mouths until they have a few drinks and now they feel in uninhibited and confident. People self-medicate bipolar illness with alcohol. So on one level, Addictions have to be seen as self-medications. And these days we talk a lot about concurrent disorders. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, 
naturally it's a, they're concurrent disorders. As a matter of fact, in most cases of addiction, you're going to find disorders that were present long before the addiction was present. So again, the addiction is the attempt to solve a problem. It's not the primary problem. Now, let's look at things a bit close, more closely. I've talked about the opiates. The opiates have been around for thousands of years, and, and medicine has used the opiates for thousands of years, obviously, for pain relief. Opiates are the most powerful pain relievers that we have. And when I was working in palliative care, looking after terminally ill people, thank God for the opiates. Because without it, a lot of people would be dying in, in agony uh, who can actually be made to help to feel comfortable with the opiates. They're the most powerful pain relievers that we have. But the thing to note is that they don't only relieve physical pain, they also relieve emotional pain. In fact, it turns out that the same part of the brain that experiences the suffering of physical pain also experiences the suffering of emotional pain. So if you subject people to emotional rejection while they're undergoing a brain scan, the same part of the brain will light up as if you stuck them with a knife. And that's why we talk about what you said hurt me so much. Well, that felt like a stab in the heart. Because pain is pain. Now, the opiates are very powerful in that part of the brain. In other words, that the use of opiates is an attempt to relieve pain. In fact, if you look at all the substances of abuse, cocaine is a local anesthetic. It numbs nerve endings. Uh, cannabis, of course, as we know, has analgesic qualities. Alcohol is a pain medication. What do you say about somebody, an old expression, uh, who's drunk too much, you say, oh, he's feeling no pain. These are all attempts to soothe pain, or at least to divert yourself from pain. And all the addictions are, whether they're to sex, or to gambling, or to internet, or shopping, or work, or whatever it is, these are all attempts to escape emotional pain. And that means that the first question in addiction is not why the addiction, but why the pain. And to understand people's pain, again, you have to look at their lives. You have to look at their lives in the context in which those lives were lived. You can't just look at genes. You can't certainly look at choices as if that was a meaningful explanation. Now, looking at the physiology of addiction in the brain, it's even more revealing. <clears throat> so why is it that the opiates even work? So you get this poppy that grows in Afghanistan, and you get the opium. And uh, you get the derivatives of opium, like codeine or morphine or heroin. Or you get artificial products that resemble the heroin, like Oxycontin and uh, hydromorphone and so on. And these substances exert this powerful pain-relieving quality in the human body and brain. Now, why is that? Like, how come a plant derivative from Asia has such a powerful impact on us here in North America? Well, the answer is, of course, as many of you know, that we have our own opiate system in our body. We have these substances called endorphins, and endorphin simply means endogenous morphine-like substance. And the job of the endorphins is precisely to play the same role that the external opiates play, which is pain relief. So we have our own pain relieving system. The question to ask is, how come some people don't have enough of it? And the endorphins play three significant roles in human life. They play many roles, actually. I won't go into them all. But three major ones in terms of addiction that we have to consider. First is pain relief. So that the, the endorphins that we have ourselves provide us with pain relief. So when you have the so-called placebo effect, that's actually the endorphin effect. Secondly, they give us the experience of pleasure and reward. So whenever you feel elated, when you feel happy, joyful, that's because you have lots of endorphins being released on your brain at that time. And whatever activity will release those endorphins for you, you might become addicted to that activity if you, slack, if you lack sufficient endorphin the rest of the time. So joy, pleasure, uh, elation, reward, that's the job of the endorphins. The third job of the endorphins is really the crucial one. It's the key one. It's the one central to human life, without which human life is not even possible. Because the endorphins make possible 
that which ensures the continuation and the very existence of human life, which is to say love. In fact, the person who discovered them called them molecules of love. That was Candace Pert, an American researcher. Now, why, when I say love, I'm not talking about gooey sentiments here. I'm talking about the quality or the dynamic of attachment. Attachment being the instinctive drive to be close to somebody. Why? For the purpose of being taken care of or for the purpose of taking care of somebody else. So endorphins are essential for that attachment drive. If you take, if you take small uh, mice whose uh, endorphin receptors have been genetically knocked out, these little mice will not cry for their mothers on separation. Now, what would that mean in the wild for them? It would mean their death. In other words, the endorphins are essential for the attachment relationship without which the helpless young just don't survive. And that's why we have such a powerful attachment instinct, so that we can take care of each other and that when we need it, we can be taken care of. And obviously then, uh, contact, connection, love, these are mediated by the endorphins. Now, I want you to imagine a human being who for whatever reason, whatever reason, comes to the conclusion, of, let me step back a minute, so one sex trade worker in the downtown east side, when I asked her what the heroin did for her, she said, the first time I did heroin, it made me feel like a warm, soft hug. She was talking about the role of the endorphins in the brain, little as she knew that. Now imagine then somebody who comes to the conclusion, for whatever reason, that without this particular substance or behavior, but let's say the opiate substances like heroin and, and and the other opiates. I will not feel pain relief. I will not have a sense of pleasure and reward. I will not feel secure and connected. How are you going to take that away from them? By making it illegal? Make love and pain relief illegal? Tell them to say no to pleasure and reward and to connection and to pain relief? And that's the opiates. I mentioned dopamine. There's another little mouse in a laboratory. You give it food. Uh, you put it in his mouth. He chews it. He swallows it. He likes it. But if you put the food down a few inches away from his nose, he will not budge to eat it. In fact, he will starve to death rather than eat. Why? Because genetically, they knocked out his dopamine receptors. And dopamine is the incentive motivation chemical. Without that, we're listless. We're inert. We're unmotivated. We're inactive. We're lifeless. We just have people are who lack dopamine. So dopamine is the motivation chemical, which is therefore necessary for attention. That's why we give it to kids and adults with ADHD, because without motivation, you don't pay attention. When you have highly motivated, you pay attention. So then imagine a person Dopamine flows whenever you're seeking food, when you're seeking a sexual partner, when you're excited, motivated, when you feel really alive, when you are exploring a novel object, a novel environment. These are all essential for human life. This is dopamine activity. Imagine then a person who without a particular substance does not feel alive, does not feel motivated, is not curious, feels inert, and then they find a substance through which they can get that temporarily. Or they find a behavior like gambling or sex through which they can get that dopamine flowing. How are you going to take that away from them? Make it illegal? Tell them to say no? This is why it's so powerful. Incidentally, what I'm discussing here, um, just to make it clear, is who's susceptible for addictions. Because one of the myths, one of the many myths around addiction is that drugs are addictive. Now, it's clearly not the case that drugs are addictive in themselves. And if that seems shocking to you, just think about it for a minute. Is food addictive? Because if food was addictive, then anybody who ever ate anything should become an addict. Is alcohol addictive? Well, yes, to some people. But most people can have drinks, many drinks, without ever becoming addicted to it. 
So the point I'm making is that nothing in itself is addictive. There has to be a potentially addictive substance or behavior, and that includes almost anything in the world, actually, and a susceptible individual. So the question we're asking here is what makes people susceptible, and how does that inform our capacity to help these people? Well, continuing our traversal through the brain physiology of addiction, then you've got the endorphin, pain relief, pleasure, love circuitry. You've got the dopamine uh, incentive motivation uh, circuitry. You've got the stress circuitry, because if you actually look at the research literature, or if you look at your own life, those of you that have had addictive behaviors, if you ask yourself, when were you most likely to engage in addictive behavior, when was it? If you have a food addiction, when are you most likely to go home and stuff yourself with food, junk food? It's when you're stressed. So stress regulation is part of the normal physiology of the brain where stress is meant to ha happen because stress is a response to threat. So we have to be able to be stressed so that we can respond to a threat, but that stress can't overwhelm us because then it hurts us. So there has to be a stress regulation um, machinery in our brains and bodies. In addicts, that doesn't work very well. So what addicts do is they regulate their stresses through the addictive behavior. And not finally, but finally for my discussion this morning, the brain circuit that's involved in addiction also include the impulse regulation circuitry. Now, impulse regulation is very simple. An impulse is just an urge to do something, like I might have a sensation of hunger, I might see a half-eaten muffin over there, I might have the impulse to grab that muffin and bite into it. There's nothing wrong with that impulse. There would be something wrong in me acting it out right now, at this very second. I'm not being paid to eat muffins in front of you. <laughs> but that's okay, because there's a part of my brain, actually right here, behind the right eye, the right orbital frontal cortex, whose job it is to select out the appropriate impulses, the impulses that are helpful and appropriate and those that are not. And that's called impulse regulation. And much of the job of the cortex or the gray matter is not to initiate impulses, but to inhibit them, inhibit the inappropriate impulse. If you do brain scans on drug addicts, the commonest brain finding is abnormality in the part of the brain whose job includes the regulation of impulses. So there's nothing to say no with up here. And so that, as somebody very astutely said, the problem of addiction is not, um, not uh, f lack of free will, but lack of a free won't. Lack of a free won't. Now, the question then is, why do some people uh, find dysfunction in these circuits? How come it, these circuits don't work for them? These are the people that are most susceptible for addiction. And for that, <clears throat> I, I'll take you back to that Harvard article. And this is the astonishing fact is that what I'm about to tell you is A, not controversial, and B, fully established by current brain science, and three, continue to elude the curricula of medical schools throughout North America. So medical schools graduating from Toronto or UBC in British Columbia or any medical school in Canada do not get this information which is not surprising when I went to medical school in the 1970s, but it's almost astonishing today. And here's what the Harvard article says, summarizing decades of brain research. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth. Now keep that in mind, because I'll be saying to you that the prevention of addiction needs to begin at the first prenatal visit if you don't want that child to become addicted, deal with the mother at the first prenatal visit. So the architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. For all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by 
the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. I'll read that paragraph again. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain. In other words, how our genetic structure and the kind of experiences that we um, undergo early in childhood actually determines which circuits in the brain will develop, which brain chemicals will develop in what quantities, which connections will be made, which connections will be lost. And is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult child relationships. In other words, the prime influence on the development of the human brain is actually the quality of the relationship with the nurturing environment. And necessary for the development of healthy brain circuits that can regulate impulses, that can regulate emotions, that can keep you connected to reality. is the presence of non-stressed, non-depressed, emotionally available, consistently available, attuned parenting caregivers. And anything that interferes with the capacity of the parent to offer that attuned, consistent attention to the child may interfere with the child's brain development, especially if the child is genetically sensitive. And if you want to look at what's happening in North America now with the burgeoning diagnosis of childhood mental health disorders, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, conduct disorders, uh, childhood bipolar illness, so-called, anxiety, depression, and so on. What's really going on is not some genetic epidemic, which is inconceivable scientifically, but what's actually going on is that parents, for so due to social conditions, are less and less able to be emotionally present and available to their kids. And that's why we're diagnosing all these kids. And so in uh, Windsor, Ontario, <clears throat> in, in the year 2008-2009, there was a 50% increase in the number of visits, childhood and adolescent visits, for mental health conditions. Now, why do you suppose Windsor, Ontario, and why do you suppose 2008-2009? Was that some kind of accident? Of course, Windsor being an auto-making town and the auto industry, thanks to facts that we all know about, I think, was in deep trouble and the parents were anxious or losing their jobs or threatened with the loss of their jobs and the kids were being diagnosed and presumably often medicated. So we end up medicating our kids for the social conditions that create interference with their brain activity. And that happens because the parents are so stressed. And this is our mental health system. Now, why is the human brain so susceptible? The human brain is particularly susceptible because most of our brain development occurs after birth and not before. So that we're born with a relatively immature brain comparing us to a horse. A horse can run the very first day of life. Human beings can't do that for a year and a half, two years. The horse is 18 to 24 months ahead of us in terms of brain development. Why? Because with our large head and relatively narrow pelvis that allows us to walk on two legs, we have to be born prematurely because already at birth, if you've given birth, you know this, the head is the biggest part of the body. And if it was any bigger, nobody would get born. And that means that the brain development that in other animals occurs inside the womb in a human being has to occur afterwards. So 90% uh, or 80% of the increase in the size of the brain happens, ap happens after birth. 90% of the circuits develop after birth. And especially in the first few years, but throughout childhood actually and, and, and into adulthood. But as I said, the process already begins in utero so that when you stress women during pregnancy, what happens is that stress is not just a psychological event. Stress is a physiological event. It happens in the body. And it's accompanied by neurological, cardiovascular, and hormonal changes in the body. And so for, um, if you take a pregnant woman and, and, and they're stressed, like they were, say, for, uh, after 9-11, they did a study on women who were pregnant and suffered post-traumatic stress disorder during pregnancy as a result of 9-11, their children had abnormal stress hormone levels a year later. 
those kids are going to be at risk for problems that have to do with stress regulation, including addiction. We know that because we stress pregnant animals in the laboratory in the second trimester. And as adults, they're more likely to use cocaine and alcohol to soothe themselves. Uh, women who are stressed or abused during pregnancy, they have higher levels of cortisol, the stress hormone in their placenta, which of course goes through to the baby. The cortisol has a huge effect on the nervous system. And those kids are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD and other disorders at age six, six or seven or eight. And on and on and on. And many, many studies have shown, uh, there's a whole new science now that just looks at the impact on brain development and, and neurological development of stress on the mother during pregnancy. Which is, of course, why adopted kids are at much higher risk because for nine months they spent time in a stressed uterus because only a stressed woman will have to give up their baby. And then, you know, the, then there's what happens after birth. As I said, what, what, what the child needs for optimal brain development is non stressed, non depressed, emotion available, consistently available, attuned parenting caregivers. Now, when you look at the uh, situation of the Aboriginal people in Canada, the First Nations people, studies have actually shown, there was a series of studies out of Notre Dame University that showed that the optimal environment for child rearing is actually, guess what? The hunter-gatherer tribe. Which is to say, the kind of society that existed in North America before the coming of the Caucasians. Because the hunter-gatherer tribe give kids a number of conditions, such as the presence of multiple nurturing adult attachments, the constant presence of adults, physical proximity, kids are never put down, you, kids are carried everywhere by their mothers and fathers, and positive touch, in other words, kids are not hit. Now this is really interesting. When the Caucasians, the Europeans arrived in North America, they were appalled by the parenting practices, and they wrote about this, of the natives, and you know why they were appalled? Because the natives didn't beat their kids. And to the European Christians, reared in the gentle spirit of Jesus, this is a crime. <laughs> and the great Canadian novel, The Arenda, by Joseph Boyden, who's a, a native Canadian writer, and The Arenda is a wonderful, grim, and very violent, but in a spiritual sense almost, novel of, of, of Huron and Iroquois life as it interfaced with the arriving Jesuits. So here's a very well-meaning and very courageous, actually, very committed, very compassionate Jesuit father writing home to his superiors about conditions here in North America. And this is what the Jesuit father writes. Now, this is fiction, but, 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 but it's not because I've seen the same reports verbatim in, 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 the, uh, in, in historical reports. <clears throat> so here's what he writes. Children and dogs run around without care, rolling in the dirt with one another. If there's one thing I will never go accustomed to, it's the savage's inability to chastise their children. In all my years here, I've never even seen an adult raise a hand in anger toward a child. Indeed, this should be one of the first behaviors we must try to correct. So that's what you got. And then you take these people who optimally knew how to parent their children, not because of brain science, but because of human intuition. They haven't lost their connection to themselves yet. And then you take them, for, then, then you do the, just all the things that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has outlined, the forbidding of their spiritual ways, the forbidding of their language to their kids, the pin through the tongue, the loss of lands, livelihood, the attempt to destroy their very essence as a culture. And then, for a hundred years or more, the legalized kidnapping, torture, and abuse of their children, generation after generation. And those same people who had no addiction prior to the coming of Caucasians, and consider that one, because it wasn't for the lack of potentially addictive substances. There was tobacco here. There was peyote in some areas of North America. There were all kinds of plants people could be addicted to. There was even alcohol in some areas, but there's no history of addiction. If it's genetic, how come? So you take those same people, 
And what do you have now? You have the fact that across Canada, if you look at the jail population, 30% of the people in jail are First Nations origin, mostly due to uh, drug-related problems. In the downtown east side of Vancouver, 30% of our clients are First Nations people, even though they only make up 2 or 3% of the population. If you get to look at the jails or the uh, child apprehension system, the ch children in foster care in the Prey provinces, 70, 80% of the people in jail or in foster care are natives. Then on the Prey's, they make up maybe 10% of the population. What's that all about? What it's all about is the impact of that trauma on the brain development of these children. And the problem, of course, with trauma is that it's passed on one generation to the next. I know that I had my trauma as an infant, as a Jewish infant under Nazi occupation in Hungary. I know that I passed on trauma to my kids. I didn't mean to, but I did. And we all do, to the extent that we haven't realized it and dealt with it. And so, I mean, one of the positive benefits I hope will accrue from this public recognition is that we actually start dealing with the effects of it. It's not enough simply to apologize for the past. We have to see what are the impacts of that past in the present. Well, one of the major impacts of that past in the present is addiction. And so to deal with addiction as it was a legal issue or some behavioral choice that somebody stupidly made leaves us completely disempowered from dealing with it. So then, how then do we deal with addiction? Well, the, the first point is that there's no one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, we actually have to, meet people, meet, have to meet people's needs where they're at at the moment. So um, for two years uh, in Vancouver, I worked as a physician at the detox facility associated with the supervised injection site. Insight, it's called. Supervised injection site, SIS. It's North America's, and I say this to Canada's shame, only supervised injection site. And I say this to Canada's shame because there ought to be several of such facilities in Toronto, and there ought to be such facilities in every significant city, including Hamilton and elsewhere. Now, <laughs> why? Why should there be? Why should there be such facilities? People say, well, supervised injection is not the answer to addiction. Damn right. It's not the answer to addiction. It's not intended to be the answer to addiction. It's intended to reduce the harm of addiction. It's intended to reduce the harm because clearly when people uh, inject under supervision, they're more likely to inject into a proper vein rather than into the muscle. So they're not going to get an abscess. They're, they're of course, completely, they're, they're not going to be injecting themselves with the HIV organism or with the, um, or with the hepatitis C virus. So you're going to have save money, not to mention lives and health and suffering. Now, I think it was Ontario's Minister of Health, and I can't quite say this for sure, but I believe who said last year, they were talking about a suicide injection site in Toronto, and, and, and I think she said, well, of course, if you, present us, you know, if you present us with the evidence, we're happy to consider it, which is a typical political uh, cop-out, because the evidence has been published in major medical journals, several dozen at least two dozen, I know about, but that was a few years ago, so even more now studies that have shown the health benefits, the psychological benefits, the community and neighborhood benefits, the legal benefits, the financial benefits. And a few years ago, when I was asked to come to uh, Ottawa to address the Senate committee that was dealing with the now past omnibus legal bill, which is increased sentences for drug crimes and all this kind of stuff, keep pe let's keep people in jail longer. And I was saying to the politicians, look, you expect me to practice evidence-based medicine. How about you practice evidence-based politics? <laughs> uh, 
And at the time when the federal government was fighting its expensive and cruel battle against harm reduction and supervised injection, trying to shut down the only site in Canada, I wrote a letter to Mr. Harper. And for some strange reason, he never wrote me back. <laughs> and I just quote you what I, um, what I said here, because the point I want to make is that harm reduction, including supervised injection, which is only one facet of harm reduction, it's not just a question of physical uh, prevention of illness. It's not just a question of financial benefits. There's another benefit that's more intangible, but I think it's the crucial one which is that if you understand what I'm saying, then you'll see that the people that you're dealing with were all traumatized. No, yeah, well, I haven't even talked about that, have I? Uh, which is, the, if you look at the large-scale studies, uh, in the downtown east side, in, in t 12 years of work, I did not have a single female patient who had not been sexually abused. They had all been sexually abused, all the women I worked with, every single one of them. And the men had all been abused, 30% of them or more had been sexually abused abandoned, neglected, traumatized in all kinds of ways. And if that was only my personal observation, that would be interesting, but hardly persuasive. But it's also what large-scale epidemi epidemiological studies show. So if you haven't already, please familiarize yourself with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, the ACE studies. You can look them up online. And these involved 15, 16,000 people, 14,000 people. And they've been repeated elsewhere, same results every time. The more adversity a child experiences, the more trauma, sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, the death of a parent, a divorce, the jailing of a parent, violence in the family, addiction in the family, mental health on the part of a parent. The more of these adverse childhood experiences, significantly the greater the risk of addiction. So by the time a male child has experienced six of these, and they rarely come in singles, by the time his experience, child has experienced six of these other child's experiences, his risk of having become a substance-dependent injection-using addict is 4,600% greater than average, a 46-fold increase. So this is not just my personal opinion, and lots of other studies which I quote in my book and which are easily available. So the point is that we're dealing with a traumatized population. And that means that, see, when you're traumatized, it, it, that affects your brain development. It physiologically affects your brain. You can see the effects of trauma in a child already, in a five or six year old, if you do brain scans. But quite apart from the physiological effect, there are certain psychological effects. One of them is, if your caregivers hurt you, if you were traumatized in your family of origin because your parents were abused and now this is how they relate to their kids in an abusive way, then one of the first things you learn is not to trust caregivers. Why would you? They're supposed to help you and look after you, but actually they're going to be a source of pain and danger for you. Well, that means that is transformational if people come into a healthcare system, which they don't for the most part, but if they came into a healthcare system that met them where they are, and this is where the community clinics, I think, do such a great job, or at least attempt to, is you're trying to meet people where they're at and receive them with compassion and receive them with understanding. So when somebody comes in who's an injection drug user and you say to them, look, we get it. Right now, you're in so much pain that for you, this is the solution to your life's problems. So let's help you use under safer, more benign circumstances. That's much more than just a physical service. You're actually giving them something that maybe they've never experienced before, which is just acceptance for who they are at that moment. That's really powerful. And this is what I tried to convey to our prime minister in my letter. This is a difficult population to work with because of the uniformly tragic early childhood histories, they do not well know how to take care of themselves and they do not readily seek help from health providers. The supervised injection site is a link, for some their only link, between their street lives and the healthcare system. And for many, it is one of the first institutions they have encountered 
where they feel treated in a supportive, humane way. Because think about their history. As a kid, they had ADHD. As a kid, they were oppositional. As a kid, they were um, troubled, scared, anxious. They acted out. The school punished them. The teachers punished them, criticized them. Then they get into the juvenile detention system and all that. What's been the experience with authority figures? Re-traumatization. So for some, and, and then they go into the emergency wards and how are they treated there very often? By doctors who are not trained in trauma. I lecture at the medical students at the University of British Columbia once a year. It's the one time in four years that they hear the word trauma except in the physical sense of physical trauma, you know, like a car accident. So it's the only link between their street lives and the healthcare system, and for many, it is one of the first institutions they have encountered where they feel treated in a supportive, humane way. For the physically and emotionally wounded people they are, this is no small matter. The SIS is a far from a full answer to the complex problem of drug addiction, but it is an innovative and necessary small step, a project Canada can be proud of, and one in time that we emulated in many jurisdictions around the world. Well, at, at this point, of course, the federal government and local governments, for the most part, have either been indifferent or hostile. Why? Because we judge the addicts so harshly. Some of you think the addict is different from the rest of us. The heck they are. They're just addicted to certain things that we've decided were bad and illegal. There's much worse addictions than drug addictions, actually, in terms of their impact on society and people's lives. But we've scapegoated certain people because we're not comfortable. And we're not comfortable with the idea of trauma because it brings up our own pain. And I, I believe that one of the reasons that medical schools don't talk about trauma is because Physicians are very often traumatized people themselves. And it's very difficult and painful to look at that in yourself. Let's just control the symptoms in somebody else, but let's not deal with the full depth of what really happened here. I will need to bring this to a close very soon so that I can answer your questions and have some conversation. Um, when it comes to recovery and, and treating addiction, there's not one model. It's whatever works. So for a lot of people, the 12 steps work. For a lot of people, they don't work. I don't care. Whatever works. The ultimate point is that there's nobody, there's absolutely nobody who cannot be redeemed. Because the good thing is, even though the effects of the brain on early trauma and early adversity are severe and long-lasting, it's also the case that the human brain retains its capacity for new development even later on in life, even past childhood. And thank God for that. And, that, and, and also, of course, we know that, that uh, psychologically and spiritually, people can grow and people can develop and people can transform. Thank God. I'm personally grateful for that. I'm 71 now, and I would not wish to be as stupid as I was when I was 70. <laughs> so that. I'm just glad that growth and transformation are, are, are forever possible for us. Now, the title of my book is In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. It's a Buddhist phrase. In the Buddhist uh, cosmology, we go through these different realms. One of them is the realm of the human realm, which is our ordinary selves, just you and I sitting here at the present moment. Then there's the animal realm, which is our drives, our appetites, our, our urges, our, our deepest... Um, instincts. There is the hell realm, which is the realm of terror, rage, hatred. And the point, of course, is, is that it's not that we're one realm or the other, uh, always. It's that we cycle through them at any time, right? Like in a day, I can go through all six of them. But the hungry ghost realm, uh, the, the, the creatures are depicted as ones with large, empty bellies, Small spiny necks, tiny mouths, small gullets, narrow gullets, so they can't get enough nourishment. And so they're forever hungry. These are the hungry ghosts. They haunt their lives without ever being fulfilled. That's the realm of addiction. 
And if you've understood what I said, my argument is that people cycle through the hungry ghost realm precisely when they're trying to escape the hell realm. And that insatiability, that always having to have more, yet again, yet again, yet again, that characterizes our whole society in a lot of ways. It's not as restricted to the street corner drug addict. But again, the good news is, is that <clears throat> that emptiness can be found to be illusory once we get to know ourselves and once we get to know reality. And that's when we talk about recovery, what are we talking about? The word recover itself is an interesting word. What does it mean to recover something? It means to find it, to find it again. And clearly, you cannot find something unless it's been there all along. You just didn't see it. And any of you here who have considered that you recovered from addiction, what did you find again? What did you recover? Tell me. Control. What's that? Control. Control? Well, that's one part of it. But what is it really that you found? Self? Yeah, self. You got yourself back is what you got. And that means that the true self has been there all along. It's never been destroyed. Not all the trauma, not all the suffering, not all the dysfunction can destroy that true self. And uh, Thomas Merton, the uh, Catholic monk, who was a spiritual uh, teacher as well, uh, I'll say what he says about victory and recovery of the self. Before I do, let me quickly, and this is my ADD brain at work, cycle back to genetics, because uh, I don't want you to think that I don't think genetics has anything to do with it. It does. What is the case is that there's no addiction gene. There's no gene that's going to make you into an alcoholic or make you into uh, a drug addict. But there are genes that make it more likely that you will. And what are those genes for, do you think? You know what they're for? They're for sensitivity. The more sensitive people are genetically, the more they're going to suffer. The more they suffer, the more they need to escape from pain. So very often, the most addicted people are the most sensitive people. The most hardened people are the most sensitive people because they have to harden themselves in order to survive their pain. Let me read you another quote from the book just to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is from, uh, this is about a policeman in Toronto. Detective Sergeant Paul Gillespie, head of Toronto's sex crimes unit, rescued children from the purveyors of internet pornography. As the Globe Mail reported on his retirement from police work, six years at that job had not inured him to the horrors that he witnessed. And I quote the Globe and Mail here. I'm sorry, uh, Steve. It's the <laughs> Paul, you live with it. Paul Gillespie can't get used to the sounds of crying and pain in the graphic videos of children being raped and molested that he has seen all too often on the web. It's beyond horrible to listen to the soundtracks of these movies, said Canada's best-known child porn cop. But it is the silent images of desolate children that um, tear most um, in his heart. They are not screaming, he's just accepting, he said, of the infants captured in his pictures. They have dead eyes. You can tell that their spirit is broken. That's their life. Now, two points I want to make here. If that same policeman, compassionate, committed, dedicated, had, instead of quitting the force, had transferred to the drug squad, who do you think he'd be chasing in the streets? Those same children that he didn't rescue. Because according to all the data, they're the ones most at risk to become drug addicts. So that's as much sense as we're making in society. We fail to protect children from harm. In fact, we create social conditions in which harm is almost guaranteed. And then we punish the ones that we have been harmed that we fail to rescue or protect. This is the logic of what we call the criminal justice system in Canada, and it's a good name. It is a criminal system. That's the first point in terms of how it treats people. And then the worst ones, the most difficult ones, we put them in isolation. 
which is increasing in Canada, according to Golden Mills report recently. And you know what isolation does to the brain? It deprives the brain of dopamine receptors. You can show this on brain scans. So that's the first point, is the absolute illogic of what we're doing in this country. Instead of those same funds, that same energy, being put into treatment and prevention and care and rehabilitation. The second point is those dead eyes. Why do the eyes go dead? It's self-protection. It's a shutdown of emotion because of the pain and the stress and the trauma too much to bear. So you shut down emotionally. And that means you become hardened. And when you become hardened to your emotions, you lose yourself. You lose the connection to yourself. So that loss of self is actually starts off again, as I read that in that article for you, as an adaptation to stress. And the, the healing of addiction has to promote the recovery of that self. And what's needed for that? Well, now I'll go back to Thomas Merton, who says, <clears throat> in order to gain possession of ourselves, we have to have some confidence, some hope of victory. And in order to keep that hope alive, we must usually have some taste of victory. We must know what victory is and like it better than defeat. So this idea that people have to have negative consequences is just, just one more way to hurt people. What people actually need is not negative experiences, but positive ones. And the victory is when you're treated like a human being, where you're not mistaken for your habits, where we see the human person, including that true self, underneath that dysfunctional behavior. That's what victory is. And if we can grant people that victory, we can terrifically increase their chance of recovery. So whatever we, whatever we do, whatever our practices or techniques or programs or policies are, they have to be informed by science, understanding the science of trauma, brain development, and so on, and by compassion, which both lead us to the same conclusion. And I believe that if we had a science-informed and compassion-informed policy towards addiction, we would not only have a much more effective healthcare system for the most vulnerable and for the most hurt, but also we'd have a much better society for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. So how much time do we have? Sorry? We have 25 minutes for questions. And I understand there's mics throughout the room. And you have those of you that have not, we'll, I'll be doing a workshop later on. And we'll get into this stuff in much more intricate detail. But if, you, if there's anything, comments you want to make, um, questions you have, please find your way over to a mic. And somebody at mic one, wherever that is. Right here. Sorry, can you wave your, I get the lights are in my eyes, so I, okay, way back there, way over there. Okay, right go over, ahead, yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Right, kind of in the direction, kind of, oh, there you are, yep. Okay, go um, ahead. <laughs> um, more of a comment, because I think that what you're pointing to is some of the conversation we've been having all, con um, all conference around uh, the fact of what is not funded in okay. our healthcare system. So right. it becomes very easy to, f to um, you know, if the only treatment to pain is a narcotic or an opiate, and there isn't actually good funding and programs for psychotherapy, trauma work, physiotherapy, um, mindfulness, those kinds of things, then what happens is, is that people end up not only self-medicating, but, but of the fast prescription drug sure. instead of actually treating the underlying thing because there's not a lot else that you have to offer, especially for people who are living in poverty who can't yeah. afford to pay for those services that aren't funded. So it sets this vicious cycle of blame and re-trauma and re-addiction and all of those kinds of components. So it's not really just a question, but it's just what you've been saying yeah. and when I hear you speak is a validation of how our system is so messed up in what it funds and what it doesn't fund. 
Absolutely, and uh, actually the Globe did have a series recently on mental health issues and in an editorial that they published, I think in the last few weeks, uh, they talked about how precisely the point I just made is that you know, therapy in, in our country is not funded. And, um, but I have to say though, I really have to emphasize that the issue is much more than just that of funding. The issue is also lack of awareness on the part of healthcare providers. Uh, again, this trauma-informed perspective simply does not enter into the education of teachers. Absolutely. Of physicians, of many psychologists even. And so that, before, so that the funding issue in some ways actually reflects the ideological issue, which is that of the ignoring and denial of, and the, of the impact of trauma. So I agree with you. I'm just saying that unfortunately, the problem is even broader than that. It's one of, um, one of awareness, which is sorely, sorely lacking. Microphone two, wherever that is. Okay, there it is, please, yeah. Hi. I'm uh, Travis Busnell. I uh, live in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, I noticed you made a reference to uh, the residential school uh, survivors and such. Um, but I, w what I really want to bring attention uh, to yourself as well as the audience is we, we have discussions around the challenges that First Nations face, but I, I don't think people understand um, the, geogra the geographical realities. So I'm, okay. I've been fortunate to have grown up in Toronto and I currently live in Thunder Bay. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm from a community that has road access, but you, we're talking about uh, not only, you know, not, not just health, but when you're working with addictions, you see communities that are flying, uh, fl flying, right, and then you also have road access for about maybe six weeks. So you're looking at, um, you know, um, physicians who don't specialize in addictions that are prescribing Suboxone, right. Uh, you look at programs that can't be monitored as effectively as you as you hope. Um, right. Minimal funding opportunities for First Nation communities to actually incorporate a holistic approach. Yes. And then, because there's minimal resources for these restrictions or, or for the inability to, I guess, um, to develop these real programs and, and meet people as as you say in the moment, people are forced out into urban centers like Thunder Bay. Yes. Where you have methadone clinics just popping up. Um, yeah. You know, we have a population of about 110,000 people there, and we have about eight methadone clinics. Yes. And I, that's probably half as much as Toronto, you know. And, and uh, is there, yeah, okay. And is there Suboxone up there at all? Uh, suboxone is, but, but, but even then you struggle with how Suboxone is paid for. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. if you're within, I think it's 100 kilometers of a methadone clinic, then they won't pay for it. Right. And then you got to get specialized approval and all this n nonsense. And yeah. and I'm not arguing against suboxone or against methadone, but I'm, you know, what what our people struggle with is we're we're in communities and we're, and we're forced to leave our communities yeah. I understand. and get sucked into these other mechanisms um, of of treating ad addictions. But again, I, I just wanted to bring light and feel free to comment as well. But we struggle in how we address our our addictions programs. Um, limited resources. You know, people have to redesign homes so they could have a detox center. Yeah. And then you have people who aren't trained yeah. monitoring people for, for two weeks yeah. and all this all this fun stuff. But yes, um, you know, I encourage you as well uh, throughout your your letters and your political uh, endeavors to continue to bring to to light. Not only the struggles, obviously, that First Nations face, but the struggles that we're facing as communities across Canada is into developing real programs. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. I'm Liban Gabra Mikhail. I'm from uh, Taibu Community Health Center at uh, CHC. That's uh, working with the black uh, communities across the GTA. And I was just uh, wondering, um, we, you know, we, we are witnessing a lot of violence in our communities and particularly within the younger age population. Yeah. And violence uh, now being looked at as a public health issue, not so much as, a, um, as just a social issue, but a public health issue. Right. And, and looking at the 
interaction between violence and mental health and violence and uh, mental health and criminal justice system, as you were saying earlier on. Um, how much can we use this um, philosophy of recovery or the recovery model to address violence? I don't know if you had any kind of points or wisdom. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, there was an interesting study about violence. Uh, I think it was in New Zealand. They looked at violence in a population, and they found that the most violent people had a certain gene. They also found that the least violent people had the same gene. <laughs> As compared with the average person who was neither in the most or least violent group, who didn't have that gene. So the same gene potentiated both more propensity to violence and less. What does that tell us? That the gene wasn't for violence, it was for sensitivity. And the people that were most violent came from homes where they were, where they were hurt and abused, and the people that were least violent came from homes where they were nurtured well, and they each were very sensitive to what happened to them. Which means that violence in an individual is not a manifestation of anything about that person in particular, but it's actually a manifestation of the conditions of life. Now, if you look at the anger that's behind violence, the deep frustration, as a psychologist friend of mine, Gordon Neufeld, with whom I wrote a parenting book, uh, said that frustration is the engine of aggression. Frustration is the engine of aggression. Engine of aggression. So, if we want to deal with violence on the social level, we have to see what is it that people are so frustrated about? Now, what is it that we're frustrated about? When our needs are not met. That's when we get frustrated. And what is the greatest need of human beings? For connection, for attachment. That's built into our brains. That's our instinctual, the most powerful drive. Therefore, what these people need, what these communities need, because the connections in the home have been so stressed to the, po to the breaking point, we had to develop a social policy around connection. So it's not just a question of addressing the, the, the anger and you know, anger management programs and this kind of stuff, or the punishment of violent behavior, but building socially, consciously developed programs and institutions where people can connect and especially when people could connect to nurturing adults. Because what happens to a lot of these young people is that you find that their deepest connections are not with nurturing adults, but with one another. So you've got this society where a whole, a whole society in the digital age has made it a lot worse, actually, where, where people are, young people are more influenced by each other than they are by adults. So we need to build and foster a culture of uh, connection and, and, and of adult leadership. That's what these young kids need. And they take to it very quickly, and they take to it very positively once it's given to them. It's just not offered long enough or often enough. <coughs> Mike, two again. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Maggi. You know, there's so much to take away from your talk. Uh, the couple of things, uh, nuggets that uh, I'm taking away, and uh, m my comments are not questions, but really, maybe I really would like some response from you on this. One thing I've taken away is um, the child before the, it's born, mm -hmm. and the conditions that the, the pregnant mother is exposed to, right? How do we change those? And for those, I think, you know, coming from a CHC perspective, you know, got prenatal programs, better beginnings, and all of those kinds of things. But something else that I've taken away from you is that maybe it's our society, the way that it has developed, uh, or the way we are developing it, that is exposing all of us to those kinds of unnurturing, isolated conditions. And I don't know what comments you may have. How do we, in an upstream way, if CHCs are about upstream action, what can we do that is beyond the realm of healthcare? Um, where should we be putting our energies? Well, um, first of all, uh, <laughs> a 
as a, as a regard to comments about society, I'm just working on my next book, which is mm -hmm. going to be entitled Toxic Culture. Yeah. And for all the reasons that you said. In terms of energies, well, you know, I don't know that I can advise you on policy. I can certainly give you an opinion about intention. And intention is important. And um, the intention at the community clinics ought to be always beyond the immediate presenting problem. The intention needs to be at sources, not just at, at, not just at um, effects, at the underlying issues, not just at symptoms. When it comes to pregnancy care, when somebody comes in for prenatal care, the intention needs to be far beyond the ultrasounds and the blood tests and, and the physical parameters. It ought to be on the emotional health of that woman. <laughs> and so that uh, conversations need to be held fairly early in the pregnancy about stresses. What are your relationships like? How much support are you getting? What are your emotional states like? What do you do for... Um, stress um, relief? Are you aware of mindful practices for stress reduction? All, all this ought to be, what happened to you as a child? What are you still carrying perhaps that's in your way? So if we have the intention of, of, of um, shining some light into these areas, I, I believe we could have a much more comprehensive and much more effective uh, prenatal care system without that costing a whole lot more money. In terms of broader intentions beyond pregnancy, well, these are called community health clinics, and, and the emphasis really needs to be in the community. So that beyond the issue of health, there needs to be the issue of community. And how much community is there uh, supporting the people that come, come into you uh, your, uh, to, for your advice? And how, much, how effective could you be in helping to foster a sense of community? And what programs would do that? How can you bring people together so they don't feel so alone? Mike one now, where's that? Over here. Okay. Hi, Gilor. Um, my name is Jason Altenberg. I work at South Riverdale Community Health Center here in Toronto. And we were one of a number of community health centers that are preparing exemplin exemption applications to open an SIS in Toronto. Okay. Um, I appreciated your comments about the need for such services here um, and, and throughout the province of Ontario where active drug use is ubiquitous. Um, and, and based on your presentation today, we're not going to be in a position to not have to respond um, to problematic substance use anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and while even though we will work on the social determinant issues that cause these, yeah. these problems, so given that we, um, and, and there are some of us who've been actively working for a number of years to, to, uh, to do this, we're, as of probably later today or tomorrow, we're going to have more hurdles from a policy perspective with the passage of Bill C-2, yeah. um, the so-called... Not uh, in my backyard. Yeah. Um, so we're in a position where the policy yeah, context sorry, is... Sorry, Jason, just to interrupt you for a second. Just consider the, uh, what is that bill called? The Healthy Communities Bill? Is that what you uh, call it? Respect for Communities. Respect for Communities. Right. So their idea of respect for communities is to exclude people who've been hurt. This is their idea of respect. It's, 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 it's a perversion. It's a perversion. It's a, it is. It's all, it feels like satire, but it, yeah, yeah, it's not it being is. seen that way. Yeah. Um, so we as a sector have some voice and some responsibility to address this. Um, one of the things that we, we haven't been as successful at here as in Vancouver in this response has been a little bit because we've, we were a little bit more successful in some things. Um, we kept HIV rates lower. We, we got harm reduction out in a different way. Yeah. Um, and we have some things to celebrate. In some ways, though, it's now holding us back from taking another step. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts or advice. Uh, no. 
I, th I think you're doing what you need to do, and I think you're far more aware of what needs to happen locally than I possibly could be. I, I can only hope that, uh, I, I don't, you know, that the change of change in the mayor's office from somebody who was a, an addict in denial and hostile, that you might have a better atmosphere now, you know. But um, beyond that, uh, I'm sure you got your feet on the ground. But I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. Except, you know, um, uh, I think uh, maybe you're already doing this. But when you approach, despite my sometimes sharp comments, let me actually backtrack on it a little bit. I think that we have to approach everyone uh, in positions of authority or positions where we perceive that they are blocking our path. We also have to have compassion for them. Uh, we have to understand that they're just stuck in a certain point of view. They're probably doing the best they can with what they believe. And so not ever to become um, hostile to anyone. And, 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 the, and sometimes the public, uh, and especially these days of digital media, people say such ugly things anonymously, you know, and it's so difficult to maintain our own balance in response to hostility or ignorance. But I think you need to be compassionate even with the hostility and even with the ignorance. And if we can maintain our own balance, I think it will be that much more successful. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jane Molkowicz. I'm chair of the board at the Hamilton Urban Core Community Health Center. But I'm here actually wearing several hats, and one of them is a longtime fan of yours. I've, I've got your book, I've seen you speak one time before, but it was actually by Skype, so I'm glad you're here in person today. <clears throat> and and I, when I think about why I'm a longtime fan of yours, it's because my interaction with addictions is the one constant that's weaved through uh, many areas of my life, including personal relationships and family, including several different jobs I've had, and, and not just in, in, at Urban Core in Hamilton, where I was once a project coordinator for a mental health integration project, looking at integrating mental health and addictions issues into the rest of the practice, and now on the board there, where the center continues doing the best work that it can. But in my day job currently, I'm also uh, litigating counsel for the Nurses Union in Ontario, Ontario Nurses Association, and um, often spending a lot of time working with nurses with addictions who uh, are exposed to all kinds of uh, drugs and narcotics and, and end up uh, treating, self-treating themselves with pain and getting into problems with addictions. And one of the problems I'm having currently is finding addiction specialists. Here in Ontario, uh, we've had several good ones who are retired or close to retiring, and there's not very many people going new into it. And so this is a long preamble to talk about all the various interactions that I've had in my life with addictions and why I respect your work so much. But my, basically, my question is, how do we get more of you? Um, a, previous, a previous questioner had, asked, had put it in terms of funding, and I agree funding is a problem, but I'm also um, dismayed or, or uh, w wondering how do we get more medical professionals interested in, in the very, um, I was going to say specialized field, but maybe I'm disagreeing with my own characterization because it touches on so many of us in so many ways, the, this field of addictions. And so how do we get more medical professionals to to specialize in, in the field of addictions? Well, the, the problem is even if they did, they would do so from a very narrow perspective. So the problem is broader than just how do you get more doctors to specialize in addiction. It's also how do you get them to specialize in addiction from a science and trauma-based perspective, which is an even larger question. I mean, I gave rounds at CAMH a couple of years ago here in Toronto, and I presented all the medical, all the scientific evidence on trauma, and the head of the addiction department, the psychiatrist, said, well, that's an interesting perspective, but of course, you know. This guy had treated addiction, they did people for 20 years, he didn't realize that every single person he saw was a traumatized person. He didn't get it. And um, in terms of nurses, um, so here's what I say to people when, it, when they ask me about medical professions. The doctors do their best in terms of what they know. And they know what they know, and they don't know what they don't know. And if you 
want to buy cookies, don't go to a butcher shop. And if you want to buy a cut of meat, don't go to a bakery. In other words, know what you're buying. Understand the limitations. Understand the gifts, the wonderful gifts, and the limitations of your healthcare giver. In other words, don't wish they were different. They are who they are. Receive what you can from them, and there's a lot of good stuff you can receive, obviously, from the healthcare system. And also understand what you can't get from them, and then see how we can give that to ourselves. Now, in terms of nursing, um, the kind of people, this is not in, at all uh, a pejorative, it's just true about people who come into healthcare in general. We tend to be people who want to save the world. We tend to be people who want to really help people. Sometimes, because we recognize ourselves, I mean, I, I maintain this with absolute certainty about addiction work, by the way, that nobody goes into addiction work who does not have their own issues with addiction on some level, whether they recognize that or not. That's part of what draws us. It's not the only motivation, but it's an important one. That's certainly true for me. I've had non addictive behaviors, as I talk about in my book, and they've had a real impact on my life and the life of my family. So the, the people that draw into nursing work are very often compulsive helpers. They take on the world on their shoulders, and they stress themselves. When they stress themselves, then they need to soothe themselves. So the issue is not just one of addiction, but also the stress that's built in almost into the nursing profession. Now, it's not up to doctors to deal with those stresses. It's up to the nurses to recognize those stresses and to find creative ways of dealing with them within their own profession and in their personal relationship to their profession. So what I'm saying is, go to the physicians for what the physicians can do for you. And it's not enough, I agree with you. But also, don't just be a passive recipient of care. Look at your lives as individuals and as a group to see what can you do to deal with whatever is driving the addictive patterns in your life. That would be my response. And in terms of your question, how do you get doctors to do anything? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Last question. This is the last question, Mike Four, wherever that is. Here, me? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so don't, let's not make this the last question because it's pretty narrow. So I am Laura Muldoon. I'm a family doctor at Somerset West Community Health Center in Ottawa. And I really want to thank you for your fascinating and really well presented talk and not a note, very impressive. <laughs> um, I, my question is, is maybe a little too narrow, but I think it's part of the whole um, societal trends that we're seeing. Um, you, what came through to me loud and clear from what you said is the importance of relationships. Yes. The, like that was number one, starting in utero and working all, all the way up. Um, and I think as a family doctor, that is something that's part of our training, is that relationships are really important. So this is what, where... Was that, was that actually part of your training? I think so. I think it may be more now than it certainly wasn't yeah. when I was being trained. But, well, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I, agree, I agree with you, yes. I'm a few years after you, but okay, not okay. that many. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, th but I think the thing that has got me really concerned in the last, let's say, five to ten years about the way we have to practice now is how that relationship is being taken out of our practice by things like chronic disease management checklists, yeah. uh, accountability agreements, yeah. electronic medical records that mean that I have to look at the computer and spend more time with it yeah. than I do with that wounded individual in front of me. Yeah. I find sometimes I barely can look somebody in the eye during their appointment. There is something really wrong about that. And I just, I, I don't know whether I'm just making a statement just to say that, you know, I think that for people who are suffering with the sorts of problems you've got, that's the wrong way to go. Um, and I just don't know what we can do about it because we're caught up in this wave, right? Listen, I, 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 it's nothing I can say that you haven't already. Uh, it's true not only just for addictions, it's true in general. Like when it comes to chronic illness, 
I mean, I, you may not agree with me or at this point, but I would argue scientifically that multiple sclerosis is also an outcome of, of, of in fact, the adverse childhood experiences studies show that the more childhood adversity, the more um, auto autoimmune illness later on. So that all chronic illnesses that you mentioned also need have to do with self and relationship, which means that the healing also has to happen in relationship, which is the very thing that, as you say, is getting more and more difficult. So we're actually going the wrong direction all around. How to address that, uh, I probably have no better idea than you do, except that, you know, we have to keep talking about it. And those of us who understand it need to insist on it. Um, but you're, I agree, systemically, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm retired from medical practice now, being too busy doing what I'm doing. I think I got out just at the right time. Because it is really going the other way. And, and the whole institution of a family physician is even very much in jeopardy, the, all the walking clinics and all, all the things that you and I both know about. So it's a dire situation. Well, um, I, I want to thank you all for listening to me. I, uh, I, I know Caversham Books is out there, so those of you that wish to purchase my books, I'm happy to sign them for you if there's time. And I'll see some of you in my workshop later on. I think that's the last question. Is that right, Wendy? So that's it? Okay, so thanks a lot very much. <laughs>